when we put this, this invitation out for this webinar, we also put out the report that we issued last week. And so I wanted to give you, before we kind of hop in to this conversation, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background about how the chamber uh, came to the report and kind of how these people have all helped us get there. Um, obviously over the last year, I think we all know what has been happening on uh, a national perspective and also here in the Commonwealth when we saw the racial inequality and kind of, uh, I would say the business community really wanted to pull up a seat to the table. Um, we saw what was happening. We know that we have you know, business leaders across the state that wanted to do something to make some substantial changes. And so about six months ago, I decided to kind of pull together a group of people that I thought could help lead this for the chamber. I knew we needed kind of a, a broad group to make sure that we were hearing all sides of perspectives of this issue. People like our panelists who have been working in this space for many years to really help guide our work and to make sure we are on the right path. And so we started meeting just kind of through Zooms, just like we all do these days, and having conversations about where the chamber could go with this issue. And what we knew was that the chamber, you know, we published reports, you know, usually a couple a year, and we started deciding that we would go in the path of a report, really looking at the research and the data that's on this issue, and really seeing kind of how we could lay the groundwork for important changes to come. And so that is kind of how we got to our report called Achieving Equity to Build a Stronger Kentucky. And obviously, when you're talking about an issue such as racial inequality, there is a lot to unpack and there's a lot more work that can be done that we did not even get to address in the report. But we were thinking of the chamber and the business community and kind of our scope of, of influence. And we decided to boil it down into three main topics and that's educational attainment, criminal justice reform and economic empowerment. And we really wanted to kind of start looking at the data and making sure that people knew what was happening here in Kentucky. And I think we all knew stories about that we knew more black Kentuckians were incarcerated than white Kentuckians. We knew some of these anecdotal stories, but I will tell you when we started kind of really digging deep into the data, the data was, was really hard to read. And it was pretty disturbing to see that these things were going on in the Commonwealth. And yet people like myself, who I thought I was in the know, I thought I kind of knew what was going on, didn't really realize the true extent of what was happening. And so we thought that this was an important first step for the chamber to take was to have this report to really shine a light and to show, be transparent with this data of what's going on across the Commonwealth. But it was really important to all of us, and I think I can speak for the panel, to not just publish a report with the data to kind of shine a light on the inequity and to kind of feel good about ourselves, pat ourselves on the back and say we did something and then put the report on a shelf and let it sit. We really wanted to make sure that whatever we were doing had action to it and that we had kind of a course of action and a map for where our work was going to go. And so I hope you guys will all take time if you have not before this webinar than after to look at the report and not only look at the data, but really look at our recommendations on how we can change the course of kind of what we, what's been occurring in the Commonwealth. We have really strong recommendations around all three of these issues. And so that's kind of where I want to start today. Um, all three of our panelists helped extensively with our report and helped guide our work, helped guide our recommendations. Um, and so now it's time to get to work. We've published the report. We have kind of shown the light on the data. Now it's time to get to work. And I think to start this off, I, I kind of told the panelists before we hopped on, I want to make this more of a conversation rather than just kind of questions and answers. So feel free to jump in. And I want this to be kind of an honest, authentic conversation. Um, I think that's how we're going to see meaningful change in this area. So let's go ahead and get into it. Um, the Chamber, we published our report last week. I did an op-ed that ran in several uh, publications this past weekend, and we've had a really positive response on our work. Some have commented they were surprised the chamber and the business community would insert ourselves into this space. And I think a question that I'd like to start off with is, what do you say to people who are worried about, when we talk about racial inequality, about saying the wrong thing or using the wrong, wrong, wrong terminology or saying, you know, this just isn't a space that probably I need to, to, to venture into. Um, Dr. Thompson, I'll start with you. I know you've done quite a bit of work in this area. 
What do you say to comments like that? Well, first of all, I, I say thank you for allowing me to comment. I, mm -hmm. I think it's important that all of us who are in the space, no matter what space we occupy, we comment. But we comment as a way to educate. We don't comment as a way to point fingers. I think that's important. First of all, I want to thank Ashley, you and Nick Rowe, who was the chair of the chamber at the time. You brought this group together. Your real concern was exactly what you're kind of paid to do, and that is to look at how can we build a business community, a workforce that builds the economy of the state. But we can't afford to do that if we're isolating people in this state to make that happen. We can't afford to do that unless we somehow educate and get people in a sustainable employed position at an equitable level. It's impossible to do that. It's also impossible for us to get fit from the bottom in poverty unless we do that. So I would answer him in this way. Let's make sure we're on the same page and talk about the same thing. This is not about finger pointing. For an example, you hear a lot about anti-racism. Well, anti-racism is different than institutional discrimination. So let me just give some nomenclature that I would like for us to think about. What we have in this society, in this culture, is a society that's built on the backs of many. It's built with race as we look at it traditionally black and white uh, in many ways within an infrastructure, and I'm calling a societal infrastructure, that has disenfranchised people of color. That's history, that's not anything made up. And because of that history, you have seen historical elements that have come out in our institutions. So what institutions been education, been workforce, being criminal justice system and so on. And whenever you look at race as one being more superior than another, then you've got a greater chance of having more stereotypes. And if you don't believe me, just think a little bit when you think of black people versus white people and think of all the things you think about. What you'll find out is that you'll end up with more negatives on one than the other, I promise you. And because of that, those things are embedded in ways that we don't consciously know about. So you hear a lot of people talk about unconscious bias. Well, that's because this is embedded in the way we do what we do and social norms and so on. Anti-racism then is not about somehow getting rid of racism. It's a way to give us the tools to handle it or be out front with it and know that it can exist and then combat it. So behaviors we're talking about here, looking at an equitable solution in education, looking at an equitable solution in our criminal justice system, looking at an equitable solution in our economy that we would allow everybody to participate at the level that they have been given being a part of this society. Our job is to point it out and in a way that we can get people to understand how we can do this together. So it's impossible to talk about this without having everybody at the table, and it's including the business community. It's impossible to talk about this with solutions and behavioral change without having people willing to look at the data, look at the analytics that tells us that there's something systematic that's going on. There's something institutional that's going on. And it causes us then to ask the questions. We are called here at this table, the chamber at higher education in my case and others to answer those questions in a very learned, truthful, honest way, but one that would allow then both of us to move forward together. Excellent. Felicia, OJ, you guys want to jump in on that at all? Sure, Ashley. I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Thank you for um, allowing me to be a part of this panel discussion. And, you know, to what everything that Aaron said, I say amen and more, right? I think that personally, um, we owe it to one another to get in the conversation in a new and different way with the idea of seeking to understand first. And I think sometimes we have lost that in, in coming together around critical issues and topics that we all need to have and develop an understanding for. But the way I have been able to enter into conversations of people who may have differing opinions is to seek to understand first. If we don't care 
and show empathy for one another, then we can ever get to a place where we're having real authentic conversations around racial equity and the, the way in which we need to create new solutions for the future for Kentuckians. Every Kentuckian matters, every child matters, and we need everyone to be able to contribute to a more prosperous Kentucky. Wonderful, I think that's important to seek to understand first. I think that's one of the things when we put out the report, it's obviously very data heavy, but I think that's where we wanted to start and lay the groundwork was to understand the problem here in Kentucky, because until you understand it, you really can't work to solve it. You don't know what solutions will work. So I think that's a perfect way to kind of phrase it. OJ, do you have anything to comment on, on kind of that question? Well, sure, I'll just be really quickly in, in terms of the additions here, because I think they've both said a lot that's really important. When I talk with folks about this, there's uh, a fright within them that if they're not race conscious, they'll be considered racist. And that's always the challenge that you'll say something that uh, you don't necessarily know a whole lot about, but that lack of understanding happens and it's, it's legitimate, it's honest. And I think what folks can do is just have, as uh, uh, Felicia said, those real conversations, those ones that are honest, that allow people to really come together uh, from a place that's real and that's raw. And from the perspective of the business community, I know we have a good member of folks within the business community listening. It's better, quite frankly, mm -hmm. from my personal perspective, that the business community voluntarily takes these things on, uh, because then otherwise it might be a government that's forcing you to do certain things uh, that might not make sense from a contextual perspective. So when business takes the lead on its own, as it should, and higher education is included in this as well, then you're able to get the deeper, more nuanced contextual issues that matter from a, a local perspective, from a Kentucky perspective. And again, the conversations are real and they can move us forward at a, at a better rate. I'm really glad you brought that up. One thing that I really like about the report is that we have testimonials from chamber members, businesses here in Kentucky that talk about the change in their business and how good it's been when they've been intentional on diversity. And when a business or a corporation decides to be or a university decides to be intentional in diversity, only good things come from that. And so that's one of the stories we really wanted to tell that it's good for everything. It's good for business. It's good for all citizens, education, and the Commonwealth as a whole. So the next question I think we have to address, and obviously we've all watched the news over the last couple of months, and our country you know, seems more divided than ever at some times. Uh, we all watched, I think, in shock a couple weeks ago when our nation uh, was, when our capital was attacked. Um, and there's a picture that kind of it stands, stands out among the rest of them. And it's that the, the man carrying the Confederate, Confederate flag through the nation's capital. And I read something recently that not even during the Civil War was that allowed to occur. And so it's the first time we think that's actually happened. What do you all make about this divide in our nation? And what can we do? And this is a big, this is a big question. What can we do to start the healing of this? And, and Dr. Thompson, I'll start off with you. Yeah, that's a great question. Let me, first of all, delineate all the things you just said in a way that I can answer it honestly. <laughs> first of all, having our nation's capital, really that insurrection, uh, that's way more than about race. I mean, that, that's about democracy. That's about the purest sense of what you believe. And this is not political, even though we somehow made it that. This is about what you believe as a core system of operating as a humanness within a society. The ability to have a voice, the ability to actually have that voice done in a safe manner. The insurrection, and that's what it is, it's not about politics and it's not about race. Injecting race as it was, and that's the Confederate flag. And let me just give you a personal perspective. I grew up in the hills of Kentucky and I'm glad I'm from the hills of Kentucky, but I dealt with some really rough stuff growing up. Went to a segregated school and I dealt with the integration process, went through the civil rights movement, saw my mother and father vote for the first time in the late sixties. All of that symbol that you see in the Confederate flag, some people argue it's about heritage. Well, I have to tell you, when I look at heritage from that perspective, it's a scary one to me. It may not be to you, but I would ask you to look at your heritage, understand it, and understand how it affects all people. As in anything that I would do, it's important. 
So when I see that, that is making a statement that somehow this is, this is a group of people of color that are fighting against uh, uh, other people and that the statement is made that we're gonna win that battle. I mean, I, I hear this comparison of Antifa versus, uh, you know, uh, those supporters. I mean, those are such false comparisons because that has nothing to do with an insurrection on democracy. You know, what I would argue is that we are called, we have these conversations about race, about equity, about inclusion. It's going to take Republicans, Democrats, progressives, blacks, whites, all kinds of people. That's what we've been given in this society to be able to have. And I've fought to get here to have that inclusion for everybody to have that discussion and not to use my power to isolate people, but to use my power to bring people together. So looking at that only reinvigorated exactly the role I need to play in that process. Excellent. Either one of you guys want to jump in on that? Well, I look at it from the perspective of institutions. There is a little known address that Abraham Lincoln gave uh, in 1838. It was called the Lyceum Address, actually, where he, he talked about this very issue. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, it's sooner or later, even though we love our country and we love our government, if we feel like it's not working for us, whether it comes from the left perspective or the right perspective, at some point, we're going to descend into chaos and the violence. Nearly, or over 100 years later, uh, Dr. King wrote a letter from a Birmingham jail where he more or less, it was explaining why he was in Birmingham. And he said, a threat to justice uh, everywhere is a threat to justice anywhere. And he said, I can't separate what I'm experiencing in Atlanta from what's going on in Birmingham. All these communities are connected. The reason why I make that through line here in this conversation is because unless we have a society and a country and in here in Kentucky in the state where everybody believes that all of our institutions, economic, criminal justice, education in particular, can work for them, then that's when you're gonna see people who are, are crazy from one perspective or the other. And so the benefit of what we are able to do as a group and what the report speaks to is making sure that our institutions are working for everybody. That these issues where we see injustice and we see inequity and we see disparities we're able to root those things out and fix them so that everybody can truly participate in the American experience. Everybody has an opportunity to achieve in Kentucky, but you can't do that if our institutions are afraid, but uh, that's the purpose of, of what we're working on together. Great. Actually, and if I can add one comment, um, you know, this, this event was um, really representative of years in the making um, I think one of the things that I have struggled with since then and in conversations with white friends, black friends, you know, all of my um, family um, is we have work to do on reconciling our past in order to be able to move forward in the future. And if we don't think about the institutions and the role that the institutions play in either further perpetuating or critically disrupting um, our thought processes, our mindsets, our way of being and how we wanna show up, um, you know, we, we have a lot of work to do. So I would say, um, you know, to what my colleagues have said, add to that, this notion that we have so much work to do to reconcile the past in order to move forward. And it starts with the actions that we're taking today. We can't let up. We have to keep the, pre the pedal pressed down and um, call on each other to be better than who we are and how we show up on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and actually, let me add one other thing. My colleagues, I mean, you know, it made this thought come to mind. Many of the people who went to that capital felt disenfranchised. By some reason, they felt disenfranchised. Whether we agree or disagree with why they felt disenfranchised, they did. And I think it is important that, and I think OJ just said this to a degree, it's important that we recognize that there's all kinds of people feel disenfranchised. When I look at many of the folk I know, many are not my color, are feeling disenfranchised because they can't find jobs. They can't 
put themselves in a position where they even feel like they have a choice to get an education. They can't find in many ways ways out to not from where they live, but ways out to get what they need in order to live. And I think this is also called to importance of the chamber, of to my office and others to think about if people are feeling disenfranchised more and more every day, then we need to be asking the question, why? And what are we doing individually and as an organization or whatever you represent to make sure that they feel included? And this is where it comes down to some other nomenclature. I just want to throw out it quickly as we say it. We talk about diversity, which is a representation of people from different backgrounds, different colors, different religions, and so on. Then we talk about uh, uh, inclusion. I use the analogy of a dance. If you're having a dance, diversity is having all kinds of people there, different thoughts, different looks, and so on at your dance. Inclusion is asking them all to dance and making sure that they have an opportunity to dance. Equity is making sure that they all have the ability to dance as best as they can. And that some of us who are, I mean, some of these panelists are not as good of a dancer as I am. So they may take a little more input, right? A little more training. So the idea that that's what we're talking about here is making sure that people have an opportunity to participate in this democracy at an equitable level to participate in a level that they don't feel disenfranchised. That's great. I think it goes back to Felicia's uh, seeking to understand. And once you do that, then you can work from that. And I've noticed I've gone back and forth between calling you all doctors and your first name, but I think we're all amongst friends. So I'm just gonna stick with first names from here on out. Um, OJ, you and Taryn Sullivan, who is the executive director of the Commission on Human Rights, and he also helped with our report and was part of our working group, um, have formed a group, Anti-Racism Kentucky. Now, OJ, tell us a little bit about Anti-Racism Kentucky. So you can imagine how I felt. I was talking, <laughs> I thought I was the only one that got kicked off, but... Uh, you saw the numbers dropping down and you thought it was you. <laughs> I it, yes, I thought it was me. So Anti-Racism Kentucky uh, is a coalition that we started last summer of course, amidst everything that was going on around the country, the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor in particular, uh, Terrence and I, we just, we started texting one another and we said, we've got to do something. It, it really was just that simple. The text didn't say anything beyond that. It didn't even go into detail, it just said, we've got to do something. We said, well, what are we going to do? Uh, and a few hours later, we had a logo, we had a Twitter handle and an email, and effectively what we charged one another with doing was trying to pull together people from all across the political spectrum, all across Kentucky geographically, and getting them together to rid out any vestige of institutional racism. And Terrence and I come at this from a policy perspective. We by no means are the only people across the Commonwealth who put together a policy shop trying to figure out how to deal with racial injustice. So we definitely don't wanna take away from the folks who've been doing this for decades and for their entire careers. But we thought just given our perspective, we both worked in the, uh, with LRC and with state government that we really could move things forward. And the other thing that was unique about what we were trying to do is that we came from different political spectrums. I, as the conservative Republican, uh, Terrence as uh, the progressive Democrat, and we thought, where can we find common ground? And that was the purpose because this shouldn't be a partisan issue. As we've all said, the idea of racial justice uh, and uplift and equality under the law and opportunity, those are American values. Those are things that everybody can agree to. So we thought, how do we figure it out? And we looked at eight different working groups or eight different policy areas, agriculture, criminal justice, education, economic development, generational wealth, healthcare, housing, and workplace. And, and workplace obviously is more of the, of the business side. We thought, how can we put together different policy ideas? So we started to do that, meet with people who are experts in this field, people who understood government and how Kentucky government works, but also new voices. We wanted to elevate people who just wanted to participate in this conversation who hadn't before. And so as a result, we came up with a number of different policy ideas, uh, some of which actually made it into the report, uh, which we were thrilled to see. It means that there was a lot of consensus there uh, across the board. Senate Bill 10, uh, which obviously is one of the bills uh, that is a priority bill for Senate leadership. Uh, our conversations with some leaders uh, within the state Senate uh, helped uh, spur that bill along to some degree. Obviously, we weren't the only folks that, that Senator Givens and leadership talked to, but we were happy to play a role there. Uh, and also Representative Hebron in the House is working on 
a set of bills and she has a few right now. And basically our thoughts were this, how do we figure out how to move the needle forward with regard to racial justice in all those areas that we mentioned, but broadly uh, in the ones that mirror what the chamber is working on in economic development and education uh, and opportunity broadly. So the commission uh, was an idea uh, that we had as one of our policy ideas. We also talked about maternal mortality. Uh, unfortunately, uh, black women and women of color who give birth are more likely uh, to suffer from uh, death during the time of birth than white women in Kentucky. So all we wanna do is figure out why that is and work to solve that problem. Uh, we also looked at educational uh, issues, particularly trying to figure out how we can limit expulsions and suspensions. Again, this is no shock to folks, but uh, kids that are in uh, the earlier part of their education in particular need that socialization. They need to be around people. They need to be around their peers. Again, this is nothing new that we're understanding now. So imagine if your child or the kid that you knew was suspended just because of how they looked and because their teacher didn't know how to deal with them. They basically would be getting that type of difficult separation from their peers, potentially as early as kindergarten, first grade, second grade. So you can imagine what that does to their development, even on top of their lack of academic opportunities. So we're pushing for limiting uh, those things as well. So there are a whole host of uh, ideas that we're looking at, but again, a lot of those made it into the report. So if you haven't looked at the report, you should do that and you can hear out the rest of our greatest ideas. Wonderful. Thanks, OJ. And thanks for your leadership on that. I think it's important we don't, you know, duplicate efforts. We all work together. And I think anti-racism Kentucky has really given people kind of a landing spot where they wanted to help. They just didn't know what to do or where to go. Kind of that umbrella of we can all work together on some of these issues. Erin, we talked a lot about transparency, and that's kind of one of the themes of the report is making sure that we all know the statistics. We all know what is happening currently in Kentucky, because if we don't know, we can't fix it. I thought a lot of these statistics were, were shocking. Um, you've worked in this field for a long time. You may not have thought they were, they were as shocking because you do publish a lot of the, these, these numbers through CPE. Um, why do you think that these numbers don't get the attention that honestly they deserve? Why has there not kind of been a light shown on these numbers, you know, in recent memory? Well, first of all, they're not surprising to me, but they're still shocking. I mean, because we should not be living with this over and over again. And before I answer that fully, I, I, go, I wanna thank OJ and his, you know, his, his partner for leading some of this effort that is now getting a bill that's coming out of the House and the Senate. And I think it's important though, that we put teeth around that bill. It's more than just having to gather. It's about actually looking at these things we're talking about the data, but more importantly, how we look at the analytics. What story is it telling us? What policy direction is it taking us? What are the things that we're gonna to have to do to infuse uh, what I call teeth around some of these recommendations? We decided very purposefully at CPE in 2015 to disaggregate everything we have at least by race and gender and any other way we could do it. Because if you look at a, num a set of numbers by their total N or just as an aggregate, it, you may think it's telling you a story that's different than the story it's really telling you if you stratify those, if you disaggregate it, if you look at it. If you're gonna have policies to impact people, know exactly how you can go to the most microscopic level. If we wanna look at good learning inside of a K-12, P-12 institution or higher ed, let's look at the learner, what he or she needs, not look at the entirety of, of a university or an entirety of a school. It may not tell you exactly how to get down to it. So what I will tell you is that all of the things that we do now, and uh, you mentioned Senator Gibbons is sponsoring the bill, I think OJ and the Senate, you know, he was on this performance funding task force with us that build the performance funding model and actually just uh, put forth uh, the renewed recommendations. And we look at how to segregate and how to incentivize those elements in performance that will help us to move forward in Kentucky to get to a 60% attainment by 2030. And so what we've done in the last few years, I'll throw it in by being able to look at those numbers. We've increased over all attainment in all categories. But when you look at what we did with overall as far as a degree and credential increases since that time, it's about 
But if you look at what we've done for underrepresented minorities, it's about 37%. Because we then are allowed to take those data and then be able to give the wraparound services and the needs of the learner to close those gaps. So that's the way we have to be able to use this material, this knowledge, uh, in a way that progresses uh, no matter what we put to do. I mean, that's why I like this group at the Chambers put together, including a business roundtable, actually, you haven't talked about. It allows us to look at those data and then make recommendations based on it. Absolutely. And I think it, it kind of goes to show it's not a one size fits all approach to, to, to solving some of this. And Felicia, that kind of goes into my next question. Uh, you spent your career in education and we dove pretty deep into some statistics and education in this report. And one of the things that was shocking to me, I have a kindergartner, so I kind of picked up on these numbers, is that in 2015, the kindergarten readiness screener showed 44.5% of black students and 52.7% of white students were prepared for kindergarten. However, by 2019, so four years later, just over 31% of black students scored proficient on elementary school reading tests, while 59.3% of white students scored at that level. So that gap increased actually once a student got to school, uh, which to me was, was fairly shocking because we often talk about education being the great equalizer and you would think that some of those things would, would make things more equal, but in this case, the gap grew. So from your perspective, having done this your entire career, tell us why you think that this drop has occurred and, and what can we do to start to tackle this issue? Thanks, Ashley. So um, I'd like to start by saying, you know, I was at the state agency when we brought the kindergarten readiness screener into the state. And at that time, um, just to share a little bit of background context, we had no real way of determining how well our youngest learners were being prepared to enter into kindergarten, into the K-12 system. And so, you know, we have come a long way now that we have, you know, years of data to be able to analyze and and look at, but the big thing is we now have a place in where we can determine what are the skills, what is the knowledge, what are the ways in which young people are being prepared for kindergarten. So the fact is we have information now that we didn't have, you know, 10 years ago, and we can have this conversation. I think the other thing that's really important for us to know about the kindergarten screener and third grade assessment and reading is that those two measures of readiness or measures of achievement measure very different things. So it's important for us to keep that in mind and be careful about what we draw out of the conversation when we think about what does readiness mean as a kindergartner in relationship to how we're measuring it at third grade for reading proficiency. Those are very different things. What I do think is important that we should highlight is that the kindergarten screener should signal to the individuals and adults that work with young people where they may need additional support. And what it tells me after we look at this cohort of um, young people from, um, from the beginning to the end of this mark in time is that we, we are not providing the right supports and necessary supports for young people when we see that they may be off track, right? They're not matriculating or not maturing and hitting certain milestones, either it be in reading or in math or numeracy and mathematics or whatever it may be, the supports need to be rushed in as we do any other um, analytical data and look at analytical data when we think about um, the kinds of interventions that need to be in place for young people. But before we can even talk about interventions, we have to talk about the individual experiences. And that is what Aaron and OJ had, had spoken to just a few minutes ago. You have to be present to learn. You have to have an opportunity to learn, which means you have to be where the learning is occurring. I have a story that I'd like to share. When I was in the classroom, I you know, knew how important it was for young people to be in the classroom because that's where the instruction and engagement was occurring. 
when I left the classroom and went to the district office, I came back to visit some of my, you know, young kids at that time, and I would see them in the hallway, unsupervised. And what it, what it told me was that if you are in the hallway, or in this case now today, if you're not even in the building, you don't have the same opportunity as your peers to learn. And so to OJ's point and to Aaron's point earlier, you know, we have to look at the data, what it's telling us in the gap, but we also have to get really close to what each individual learner's experience tells us and then begin to think about what are the trends happening? What are the trends happening in my school, in particular classrooms between learners and teachers? What are the trends happening across a district? Let's get to the individual stories of each and every learner so we can know what their experiences are and we can track to see what are their opportunities and what access do they have for learning. That cohort data really wasn't shocking to me either, as Aaron would say, but it was very upsetting because we have been at this for a very long time in the state of Kentucky. We've been disaggregating data for a very long time. And yet we still have not figured out the solutions and the remedies for bringing about better and different outcomes for the very children who need it the most. I also will add, this is an important time now that we've had schooling away from school buildings where learning has been happening in homes, when families and parents and the community has stepped up in a way to provide some additional support. And there's been a greater awareness of what, their, what parents have been able to say, what my child is able to do and what they're not able to do. The pandemic has brought light to much of that. And the relationships now that we as educators need to have, have to look very different because we have parents and communities who are more empowered. They understand in a new and different way. And that is going to bring about a new calling for how we as educators work with families, with parents, with the community to provide the right and necessary supports for getting learning on a different path and trajectory for our youngest. I'm also a strong believer in early childhood education. And I know that Amy Neal at the Governor's Office for Early Childhood is going all in. She is all in on how can we bring kindergarten, first grade and early childhood educators together to really get at a different solution for what's happening um, as it relates to the kindergarten readiness screener data. So I'm, I'm, you know, this is a space where I feel like um, we've spent quite a bit of energy. We had race to the top monies when I was at the state agency where we began to see some early traction. But what appears to me that happens is we get some early wins and some early gains and we see progress and we let up. And so we have now got to make sure that we have a sustained effort and not be distracted on those key metrics where we have to see change happen in order to get young people and keep young people on the track for excellence and equity in education. And that's great, eh? not, not to be complacent once you get some, you know, some gains, not to just kind of ride on that. Uh, that's excellent. I do, I had not thought much about parents kind of being more involved, obviously, as students are virtual learning. I did uh, multiplication and division tables last night that I had not done in probably 30 years. Uh, so we're all kind of taking our part in this. Um, one that the report really did talk a lot about, and I think this is one area that uh, we knew there was, there was inequality, was in the criminal justice system. Um, Senator Whitney Westerfield has talked about this quite a bit in the last several years. We know that more Black Kentuckians are being incarcerated um, compared to white Kentuckians. And you kind of look at, when I looked at the data from education to criminal justice, you see that you know, more Black students are being um, taken out of school for disciplinary actions. And then of course, several years down the road, they're being incarcerated at higher numbers. And I'll throw this out to the group. Do you see that, that, that there is a correlation and, that, and what can we do to kind of 
break this cycle? Because I think with criminal justice, it's very kind of clear cut. We broke the data down into saying that Black Kentuckians and white Kentuckians, even if they're charged with the exact same crime, whether it's possession or whatever it may be, Black Kentuckians serve longer in, in jail than white Kentuckians. So the numbers do kind of show this. Um, and I'll throw this out to the group. What, what do you think we can do in terms of the inequality in our criminal justice system? And do you all think that there's ties going from the education system into the criminal justice system? Whoever wants to take well, that I'll, I'll start off because you all have heard me give this speech way too many times. If you look at, once again, let's look at numbers, let's look at statistics. If you look at the correlations between people that are on, let's say, like Medicaid, or people in prisons, or people that go to jail, or I keep on going, what you'll find is the strongest tie is education or lack thereof. You know, and that's, that's important to know. So it gets down to this. I think Felicia hit on it just excellent, Felicia, because I think it, get, it gets down to we have to build in a systematic way teachers that understand that not everybody was raised with the same cultural paradigm, with the same belief systems, with the same socializations. Not everybody had exactly the same people in the households uh, with parents with education. We've got to figure out what our individual students need. What they don't need is to be kicked out of the classroom while we're trying to figure it out. So you see all these as correlations, whether or not they're able to read at grade level and those that go to prison. There's also, I could talk about correlations all day long at all of these places where we lose kids. And we lose more kids of color in those places by proportion and more poor kids by proportion than other kids. So that should tell us something too. Now you, once they get in the criminal justice system, then you're dealing with people that can't afford based on in many cases, race or, or, or uh, uh, socioeconomic class, can't afford the lawyers that other people can. So they're gonna get more sentences. We've got laws that are on the books that in fact disenfranchise some people who use certain drugs more than other people who used other drugs. We even racialized that. So the idea that there are many different, what I call interventionist sorts of things that we need to do in order to do it. I call it the squeeze effect. We need to fix the laws that is disparate currently that points to an institutional racist philosophy. And we need to fix an educational system all the way through the pipeline that builds these young people to look at other alternatives that in many cases of what some people say they choose to go into. And my argument is that if you have a choice, you know how to critically think about all of them and you can decide which way to go based on the best outcome. Well, that's not the cases uh, in, in so many uh, places, but it is left up to us as educators to figure out exactly how we can intervene then on the front end. And you've heard me say over and over again, the best way to have a strong higher education system is to have a strongly, er, strong, strong early childhood system. So we got to get students involved with us. I love the student voice for this reason. We've got to get agencies that represent the community like the Richard Committee. We've got to get agencies that represent business like you, Ashley. We've got to get employers in on the front end to help us, not only in the educational process, but to also figure out how to solve this. We've got to get our legislature involved, our, our executive branch and so on. This means that we all have something to do, but we're gonna all have to do it at the same time. And it's not which comes first. It means that we have to have those inputs in order to really see a systematic difference when it comes to these racial disparities that are in our criminal justice system. That's excellent. I think that's a good segue, OJ, into this next question. Um, I know we're running short on time, and, and I think we've gotten through about a third of the questions uh, I had written out, so we're probably going to have to schedule a part two at some point. But OJ, you and I have talked a lot about in the last year, especially generational poverty, and I know that's an important um, thing to you to kind of break that cycle of generational poverty, and we've, we've talked about how education really is kind of the key to that. And so poverty is obviously a theme in this report. And we know education can change the trajectory of someone's life. 
but in the immediate kind of right now, post pandemic, unemployment insurance numbers are high, we've lost jobs. What, you know, how do you think the, this pandemic is going to, to cause, do you think the pandemic is gonna cause this gap to grow? And is there anything that we can do right now to really kind of have offset that gap between black Kentuckians and, you know, those white Kentuckians with the poverty level? Well, the unfortunate reality is that it certainly can, uh, and it likely may. When you look at the challenges that have existed as a result of the pandemic, people are losing jobs. Typically, they're folks who don't have the opportunity to work from home. Again, there are people who don't have as high of an education uh, because those professional type jobs are the ones where you can work from home. And based on, again, the numbers that we've gone through that my colleagues have mentioned that the report mentions, these folks disproportionately in terms of the density are likely to be black. So when you think about what this means long-term, you got many families in Kentucky, again, of all races, but we're, we're talking about racial equity here specifically. There are families across Kentucky right now where their kids are, are probably not getting a, a great education because they're sitting at home hoping that their internet might work. Their parents are also maybe out of a job, so they aren't getting that experience and that opportunity to promote themselves in a career. And potentially nobody in that household has a college degree or has a certificate of any kind. So when we get the vaccine up and running, when people get back to work and the economies open up across the country and across the world, what are those parents gonna be able to do? What will they be able to say that they've done and what will they be able to point to in terms of professional work accomplishments? And for those students, if they're seven, eight, 15, is this just a lost year and a half, maybe two years of education? What does that mean when they begin to compete with their peers across the board who didn't have those challenges? Their households have great internet. Their parents have excellent educations. They've got access to tutors or to private resources. The way that we deal with that now is by focusing on this challenge from an equitable perspective, ensuring that those same families get the resources they need financially and otherwise to be successful, that when we're prioritizing vaccinations and all these things that we get it out to communities, both urban and rural, where people are gonna have these challenges across the board, and that our governor and our legislators and the business community in higher education, we're all working together to figure out the best way to implement these solutions today. It's not like we don't know what to do. Again, we, we got a report now, at least from the chamber's perspective, about 25 good pages of what to do. We have a ton of bills in the General Assembly on what to do. What we need to do now is just work together, put the partisanship aside, put uh, some of these uh, issues aside and focus explicitly and directly on the kids and the families that we know will need us later because they need us today. And I think if we focus there, if we work on what's important now, then we can have successes in the future. We can be a model to point uh, to where other states look at us to figure out how we got this thing right. That's great. Uh, Aaron, Felicia, do either one of you guys want to jump in on the poverty conversation? I, I know the statistics were pretty shocking that there is a quite a big gap here in Kentucky, even more so than the national gap. So any any recommendations you have for kind of starting to close sure, that? Sure, let me say this though. 90% of the people that are on unemployment now don't have a higher education credential that matters. That's mm -hmm. important because those are the folks that haven't lost their jobs and those are the folks that can be nimble. The other thing I will ask when we, add, when we talk about the digital divide, it's not just whether or not people have internet, it's whether or not that in that house, parents who are working in the house and the kids working in the house have the power to use all pieces of that internet. It also means that in fact, many people are gonna be displaced like women. That's gonna have a harder time getting back into the workforce for a variety of reasons. We could have an hour on this. You know, I appreciate the governor and his office putting money toward helping this digital divide because that's important. But the other thing that I will say that it's important for us to have a sense of that COVID is going to offer some innovation and some challenges. It's going to allow us to figure out what's next. And this is not purely about whether we do more things digitally. It's not that. It's but the things we're going to be doing more digitally. And it's more about also what do we do now when we're back face to face. I argue that it doesn't have to be a lost view. Because if you have what I call extreme good excellence, high rigor, and a lot of input, a lot of wraparound services, a lot of instructions, we can catch up. We show it over and over again. That's actually the way you close gaps, by the way. 
you know, the idea that COVID should be teaching us what to double down on and then what to do better. And what we haven't done before, we now need to put in action to make it happen. So my argument is, let's not just talk about it from a standpoint that this is what we got. Look at our data. We got these people who are in poverty now going to be in poverty more. Let's figure out how we can target those folk very specifically, including women that have been displaced and many people of color that's been displaced. Many people in my neck of the woods in Appalachia that still was looking for a job before COVID and still are looking for a job during and after COVID. How can we understand how to impact that? If we're ever going to get fifth from the bottom, you're going to hear me say it again. The only way we can do it is to get someone a credential that matters. And I'm not talking about a four-year degree, even though a four-year degree is good. I'm talking about something that we can help them to have a sustainable employment so when downturns happen, they can stay engaged. That's excellent. I think when we talk about the pandemic, we often say that it's really heightened many of the inequities we knew we had, um, but it really shone a light on it. And I think with minorities and women obviously leaving the workforce at a much larger rate, we are now 50th in workforce participation here in Kentucky, which is a number we do not want to be. That is the very bottom, obviously. Um, it's going to take some time to kind of dig out of this hole, but I do think you're, you're right, Aaron. I mean, the upskilling and making sure that people have a credential or a degree that is going to be needed and useful in the future really is key to it. So it is, I can't believe it's almost been an hour and I want to thank everyone for that, that moment of uh, us all getting kicked off the internet, uh, but, but tis the life that we're now living. And I really want to thank our esteemed panel today. Um, obviously, we could have talked about this for hours and I'm just really appreciative and grateful of their help and their assistance to help us do the work of the chamber that we really wanted to do and to make it a good report, to make it valuable. And we did put a link in the chat function and we we probably should have done that in the beginning. Uh, for those who have not received a copy of the report, um, it, there is a link in the chat function. It's on our website as well, kychamber.com. And we talk a lot about the data. So know when you open up the report, it's going to be very data heavy. There's going to be charts and graphs. But like I said, at the beginning, and maybe this is a webinar for another day, there is a lot of action items in it. There's a lot of policy recommendations that the chamber and all of our groups will be working on, but there's also some practical solutions that businesses can start to do now. Um, and so I think that's what I wanna make sure that we, we work toward. And as we work on this important work that we keep the conversation going, we keep the work going. We don't let this just be a moment where we publish a report, talk about it for a little bit and then move on to something else. I think for us at the chamber, we're committed to working on this um, and getting all of these action items, you know, starting to tackle them. 